Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right in a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. What's good, Alaska? This is Scott Levesque, and you're listening to the Daily Dose of the Must Read Alaska podcast. I want to thank everybody for joining with me today. We have a plenty to talk about. We have a lot of different news to talk about today, including a recall vote that took place yesterday and is uh, not looking promising. But before we get into any of that, you know my plea. It's the same thing I ask every time we start our podcast, and that's if you have a second, please give us a five-star review. It helps tremendously. By the end of 2021, we're hoping to have 100 reviews, and right now we sit at about 93, and we're not going to get there without you. But why is this important? Well, three really main things. One, it helps us with search engine optimization. It helps us with our ranking within the podcast realm. It also helps us when it comes to people searching for the content we talk about on a daily basis. So if you could just take a second and give us a five-star review, it would be greatly appreciated. And I know there's a lot of extra mile people out there. So if you're one of those people, I'm I'm sitting here talking to you. If you just want to take that, that next step, that extra mile, go that extra mile, why don't you give us a written review? It takes about a minute uh, and we love hearing from our listeners. Uh, We have quite a few reviews on our podcast, and they've been overwhelmingly positive. We really appreciate all the feedback we get, and uh, we read every one of them. So don't think that yours is going to go unread. But if you want to do that extra mile thing, I want to encourage you to give us a written review. Again, it takes just a minute. We want to thank all of our listeners, our readers, and our supporters here at Must Read Alaska. You guys have been phenomenal. We really do appreciate you. And especially in days like today and in this last couple of months, we try to provide the content that you guys want to hear about. And that's what's most important to us is that we give you the content you're looking for and need. And we're really here to give you a full perspective of the news, not just a narrative or a slight, but the full perspective of what's going on. So again, thank you guys so much. We really do appreciate you. All right, let's get into some news. And before we get into the recall vote and everything that's going on with that and my analysis there, I want to talk a couple different stories here that are hitting Alaska. And one of the the ones I want to talk about, and again, you hate to see this kind of thing happening. And, and it goes everything in our life now has a has a narrative or a stream of COVID in it. And unfortunately, even news like this, it's all about the COVID narrative. Suzanne wrote a great article today about. Uh, about the Catholic Church sort of disassociating, the Catholic Church of Alaska disassociating itself from one of its schools. And it's under the title, Archbishop Officially Disassociates Holy Rosary Academy as Official Catholic School. And and listen, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of background on this. And let me just give you a quick background of what's going on. Uh, The last couple of months, the school and the Archbishop, whose name is Andrew Belisario, were going back and forth about these, quote, mandates that the Archbishop wanted to see met in these Catholic schools. The the mandates included curriculum and then health mandates. And I think you know where this is going. So over the last several months, they had been negotiating this and and really where this sort of centers and where the the genesis of this sort of divorce, if you will, happens to be around children being masked at schools. And unfortunately, this is an ugly... It seems to be something that's rearing its ugly head over and over and over again. And I know yesterday we talked about the fact that the FDA panel has approved the use of the vaccine for kids 5 through 11, which is only going to exasperate this this schism that's happening right now. Um, That's already pretty contentious within the school board meetings and parents. You add now to the fact that the FDA, and again, it hasn't been an official approval, but through its advisory board has said, yes, the vaccine is now uh, going to be available for kids ages 5 through 11. This is going to intensify those school board meetings as well as uh, what's going on right now, which is uh, in, in the Catholic world, uh, specifically here in Alaska, there there are mandates and an apparently curriculum mandates that are uh, being required of all Catholic associated schools. And what has kind of come down the pike is this, is that the Holy Rosary Academy has decided that they didn't want to mass their kids. And that didn't sit well with the archdiocese and particularly Bishop Archbishop Andrew Belisario. 
And in a statement, he wrote this. I want to read it right from the, the article here. I understand the concerns and frustrations with the situation, and I share in their disappointment. It does worry me that some children and parents feel they are being abandoned by their archdiocese. It is important for me to express that I am always kept to the care, education, and safety of children and all Catholics of the Archdiocese in the forefront of my decision. As your Archbishop, I am ultimately responsible for every Catholic institution in the Archdiocese of Anchorage Juno, including any private owned and operated Catholic school. I've insisted that the members of the school board accept the minimum standards that I have specified in order to fulfill my obligation under church law to protect all the people of God in the Archdiocese, including those who served by Ro Holy Rosary Academy. In any diocese, it is the bishop who has the authority to determine whether a school is a Catholic school. Then he writes, I respect the right of the members of the board to make decisions for the Holy Rosary Academy. The Board of Trustees cannot expect the privileges of the Catholic school without accepting the obligations of this recognition. Essentially saying, if you don't want to follow our rules completely, you don't get to... Uh, you don't get to be under the covering of the Catholic Archdiocese here in Alaska. I've clearly explained, he goes on, what is necessary to grant Catholic recognition to the Holy Rosary Academy in the new Archdiocese of Juno in Anchorage. I want to do so, but it is impossible for me to grant recognition without acceptance of the minimum standards that I have specified. Now, keep in mind, this circles around a mass mandate. Okay, just, just keep that in mind. It is circling around a mass mandate. That is essentially the big hang up here. He then writes, I regrettably as of today, October 26, 2021, I do not recognize Holy Rosary Academy as a Catholic school. Holy Rosary Academy does not have the obligations or privileges of the Catholic school in the Archdiocese of Anchorage, Juno. The students, parents, families, staff, and supporters of Holy Rosary Academy will always be welcome to celebrate Mass and receive the sacraments in their own parishes. If at any time the members of the Board of Trustees decide to agree to accept and adhere to the minimum standards of the Catholic schools that I have specified, they are welcome to request recognition of Holy Rosary Academy as a Catholic school in the Archdiocese of Anchorage Juno. So essentially what ends up happening is that they did not want to mass their kids. And I'll tell you why they didn't want to mass their kids in a minute. But they didn't want to mass their kids... And that was a, a real centerpiece of what essentially uh, Archbishop Belisario is saying they did not meet. Now, he says they didn't meet nine mandates, uh, which include curriculum. But really, the, the centerpiece of all this seems to be masking kids. And there's a good reason why this school was deciding not to mask kids. Okay, Holy Rosary Academy is not a massive school but they were bleeding kids they were they were losing kids they were losing enrollment because of these mass mandates they were losing enrollment just bottom line and i'm sure the board had convictions about it as well and i think this is a big deal listen the, we are heading to a place now and i've said this from the beginning i remember talking to you guys about this with AO 2021-91, and I repeat this because I think it's important. The message needs to get out. There is a, now there is a have and have not. There is a touchables versus untouchables. There is a, a good and evil track that is being, this narrative is being put out there, which is if you do not comply with everything that we want when it revolves around COVID-19, you are part of the bad. You are part of the untouchables. You are not, if you question anything, it's wrong. You're wrong. That language was spilled out pretty clearly in now what is the emergency ordinance prior, which was the just an irregular ordinance. But things are changing. And, and we are now segregating. We are, di we are dividing people based on this. It's either you're going to go along with everything we say or if you, if you have any questions or you decide to rail against anything that we are saying you need to do, you're over here. Bottom line. Regardless, it doesn't matter. Now, I don't know the whole story about this. But I would assume that this school did not want to lose students because of a mass mandate. So what they decided to do was not do a mass mandate. I'm going to read this. We have prayed fervently offered masses, adored our Lord for hours on end, seeking guidance and a peaceful resolution to the situation. And we have our answer. We must trust in his will and go forth confident in the work we are doing here at the school. This is the school's response, the board of trustees. 
and the headmaster. A vibrant and beautiful place of classic learning, Catholic faith, and true joy. With record enrollment. Why? Because they don't have a mass mandate. And I'm sure their school's great. Now listen, this is one of the top academic schools in Anchorage in, in Alaska. With record enrollment, strong fundraising, and amazing faculty, and an outstanding recognition for H. RA, which is the school name, by the way, this year, a bright future lies ahead for our students, families, and staff. The school has an enrollment of 150 students, which don't get it twisted. That is a big deal for private schools here in Anchorage, 39% of whom are racial minorities. 14 of students are Asian or Island uh, Pacific Islander or of Hawaiian heritage and 10% are Hispanic. Starting Wednesday, Holy Rosary Academy will be known now as Cla- the Cap- uh, excuse me, classical school in the Catholic tradition. That is a mouthful, and I don't think they had a marketer in the room when they came up with that. <laughs> Regardless, this is where we're at. So now the Catholic Church, which by the way, I could say this because I grew up Catholic in one of the most Catholic areas in the country, which is New England. There is there's so much damage control the Catholic Church needs to do outside of what they're doing here. It's pretty astounding, number one. Number two, this is the stuff that we're, we're sort of separating. You know, there's a division in the evangelical church. There's also a division in the Catholic Church. And again, it goes by this two-pronged narrative. It's either you're, you're good or evil. And, and the evil is those who question anything, who, who don't believe that everything that is being said by the, quote, good people or the people who decide that masking needs to happen, that you need to take the vaccine, that you need to do the booster, that the goalpost needs to move and you need to move with it. These are the narratives that are being put out there. And now it's, it's proliferating the church both the Catholic Church, the Evangelical Church, those are the two areas that I know of. And, and this is a problem. It's a problem. And it's going to continue to be the problem. And, and without, without the opportunity to come together, it is only going to exasperate. And this, again, is a, is a terrible problem for the Catholic Church. I mean, in my opinion, why would the Catholic Church ever be concerned about this? With everything that it needs to worry about and all the history that was drug up and and many of the errors of the Catholic Church, in particular in New England, for sure, we're we're disassociating ourselves from schools because they don't want to acquiesce to a mask mandate, albeit their school is growing because of it. Because people want their kids to learn and not be uh, muzzled with a mask where they can't hear the teacher. Listen, people that don't think that masking is a detriment to children either don't have children or just want to ignore this, the actual psychological science behind it. It's just true. It's very much true. And so this is just, to me... This is a clear example of a, of a growing divide in this country in, in, for us here in Alaska as to really the, the, the space between the good and evil conversation, the haves, the have-nots, the, those who can and those who are untouchable. I mean, it's, it's crazy to me. And it's only going to get worse. And listen, I don't know what's going to stop this. It feels a little like it's spiraling out of control. So what do you do from there? I don't know. I don't have the answers. But there's got to be better ways of communicating and understanding. And I think we start at least by being able to have conversations with those who vehemently disagree with us but are willing to have the conversation and understand. And that's just not happening. Well, as we get into the Anchorage area, we start talking about some of the things that are going on in Anchorage period, we look at the fact that the daily COVID count yesterday was about 560 Alaskans who tested positive for COVID. Uh, We talked a lot yesterday about statistics and how I'm starting to get really frustrated with what's being presented statistically about our state. Because here's the thing, we're going to go through some of these numbers and what you're going to start to understand is numbers aren't starting to add up. The, the day where you can start blaming unvaccinated people for all the wrongs is, is increasingly diminishing. 
So Tuesday's count for the new positive COVID cases in Alaska was about 560. It's a decrease of about 13-ish percent from last week. And since March of 2020, 131,000 or so Alaskans have been infected with the virus. An unfortunate death toll of 690 have died because of it. And the quote, I'm going to just give you about an average, seven-day average over the last seven days is about 685, which is decreasing, by the way, significantly. It is decreasing. Now, the problem is, is that we say that about Alaska hospitals have a, currently have about 243 COVID patients. And they say they're at or near capacity. 23% of the patients in Alaska's hospitals have COVID and 33 COVID patients are on ventilators. So we go through all these numbers, right? From October 20th to October 26th, there's been 4,800 COVID cases. That's a dip from October 13th to October 19th, which saw 5,502 cases. So they're lowering. There are 24 ICU beds available for adults in Alaska, 291 non-ICU beds available. This is according to the state's dashboard that they have. <clears throat> Providence Medical Center is the only hospital in South Central Alaska with openings in its ICU, according to uh, the counts. And then, of course, Fairbanks Memorial is near capacity. So, so we're getting all these numbers, right? This is my point yesterday. We're getting a lot of these numbers, but these numbers stop at a 36,000 foot level. If you look at the municipality of Anchorage dashboard, it says 11 percentish. So 400, out of the 443 patients who went to the emergency room on Monday were due to COVID. And there are about 112 people in Anchorage with COVID in, uh, in the hospitals. And that's about it. However, the state is claiming that 69% of Alaskans over the age of 12 are fully vaccinated. 69%. We're looking at 70%, which means, if you're doing good math, 30 to 31% of Alaskans are not vaccinated. So what does that mean? The numbers are starting to not add up. And when I say not add up, what I mean is, is that extra layer of understanding, so the strata of data... I should make a shirt. The strata of data. The stratification of data is an important tool that we need to use now. No longer should you, as a, as a reader of news, as a hearer of news, should just sit back and go, oh, okay, so we had another 560 cases of COVID. What we should ask is, out of those 560 cases of new positive COVID diagnosis, how many of them were breakthrough cases versus how many of them were unvaccinated. I want to start knowing these numbers because I got a sneaky suspicion that the, that the actual breakthrough cases are starting to grow tremendously. Last time we reported at Must Read Alaska, it was at 16% of cases were breakthrough cases. I would assume that as we continue on, that number is only going to increase. And as more and more people get vaccinated the less and less you can start blaming unvaccinated people for new cases. It's just straight math. You can't start blaming unvaccinated people for all the COVID cases when the numbers are where they are. I want to start seeing the strata of the data. I want to start seeing the idea of what we're looking at when we say 560 new cases, 873 new cases. We threw out these numbers and the underlying assumption is is that these are all new cases from unvaccinated people now some boroughs do a great job i mean the kenai peninsula borough does a great job of of actually breaking out how many and and the hospital does too i mean uh central peninsula hospital did a great job of showing how many of the new cases um and particularly how many cases that are using up icu beds that are covid are from actual vaccinated versus unvaccinated people. And I think that de data is needed. It definitely is needed because we need to know exactly what these cases are leading to. 
the data is important because the data will show exactly what's happening. Is there a trend where breakthrough cases are becoming more readily um, common versus these are all brand new cases from unvaccinated people? Because the assumption is it is. All these cases are just brand new because you hear that as sort of the narrative, right? So the narrative is this. Well, here's the deal. Most of the people that are getting that are in the hospital are unvaccinated. Most of the people on the ventilators are unvaccinated. Most of the people that are dying are unvaccinated. So the assumption is for many people, hey, those who are unvaccinated are make up the 560 new cases. I mean, just looking right now at the municipality, about 63.9 percent of of residents ages 12 and over are are fully vaccinated. 69.3% have at least one dose. So they break down the community by age. Or, or I'm sorry, they break down like Anchorage Municipality, 55%, Chugiak, 44.9%, Eagle River, 44.9%, Gerwood, 85.2%. So they break all these down. But really, it is important for us to look deeper into the data than just Oh, the topical 36,000 foot view, because there's more to this than what we're seeing. And if the idea is this, is that if the idea is that breakthrough cases are creating more of this issue than the unvaccinated people, we need to look at what that truly means. Because like I talked about yesterday, this doesn't just stop here. This doesn't just stop here. What's going to begin to happen is you're going to start to see this. You're going to start to see the fact that many hospitals are going to change how they view what the term fully vaccinated is. And why do I believe that? Because it's already happening at the lower 48. I told you yesterday and the day before, there are hospitals that are now saying you are considered unvaccinated if you do not get a booster six months after you get the two uh, the shots, or in Johnson & Johnson's case, the one shot. If you do not get a booster shot after six months of being, quote, fully vaccinated, you are considered unvaccinated. That's astounding. That's another example of the go post moving. So now what do you have to do? Well, to be considered fully vaccinated, now you got to get boosters. And thus, the goalpost continues to move. And as it continues to move, we're going to see that there's going to be more expectations on those who want to consider themselves fully vaccinated. It's fairly detrimental. And people are not playing at all. It's just, it's not happening. So I just want to warn people, this is coming down the pike. You are going to see the fact that many people are going to be frustrated because they're, they were told, just get the vaccination and you'll be vaccinated. You can have all the privileges, right? We're seeing it in Canada. We're seeing it in Australia. Just get the vaccine and you'll be able to fly this, that, and the other thing. Yeah, that's how it starts. And then what ends up happening? Well, the goalpost moves. Now you can't fly unless you're fully vaccinated plus a booster after six months. Plus, another booster a year later. Plus, another booster every five years, three years. Whatever the factor is, you're going to see that. And unfortunately, unfortunately, we've opened up a bit of a Pandora's box now. We've opened up a Pandora's box. And now you're at the whim of what those who are in power decide and consider to be fully vaccinated. I'm just, I'm telling you, don't be surprised when this starts coming down the pike. All right, lastly, we got to, I'm closing up here. I want to talk for the last couple minutes of that, this, this recall effort for Meg Zalatel in Midtown. There are a couple of final analyses that I have to say, and this is going to hurt a lot of conservatives in Anchorage, but I'm going to give you some of the run right now. As of yesterday, the early returns were in. The margin was 61.2% were to keep Meg, 38.8% were to recall her. 
So we're looking at a massive swing of 22 to 23 points. Now, ballots will continue to come in. Mail-in ballots will continue to come in. There was about, about 9,300 or so votes that were counted on Tuesday night out of approximately 36,000 ballots that were mailed out to voters in the Midtown District and really across the country because we've, we've extensively touched on the fact that double state voters were, were given ballots. Just over 5,700 votes were counted to retain Zalatel, whilst 3,618 votes wanted her to be recalled. And about 4,000 ballots are left to be counted-ish. Now, if you look back a couple months ago when the Felix Rivera recall effort was made, he survived by 56.5% to 43.5%. So you're looking at roughly about a 13 point swing in favor of keeping Rivera. I think it was in October, November ish time frame. No, that's not true at all. It was April. Excuse me, it was April. And now we have the Meg Zalatel. Sorry, I'm thinking out loud in my head, so bear with me here. Now we have the Zalatel. And listen, when you looked at the Rivera recall, you noticed that the major discrepancy was in money. The major discrepancy was in money. And the, th the thinking was, what I'm hearing out there is, hey, if we can match Meg Zalatel's money dollar for dollar, there's going to be a better chance to recall Meg Zalatel. And that was the traditional thinking. Listen, they didn't have enough money for Felix. They were outspent tremendously, probably seven, eight, nine to one when it came to the recall effort for, for Rivera. So Zalatel, they wanted to do it different. They wanted to match as much as they could dollar to dollar. Well, the problem is, is that that has proven to not be the case. Because as we said before, she is winning this recall effort 61.2% to 38.8%. A wider margin than Felix. Now remember, this is the same individual who sponsored the mask mandate. This is the same individual who pushed the purchase of these hotels way back when using CARES Act money. This is the person who wanted to use the sale of the municipal electric and power for the purchase of once again real estate. You had all those things working against her, hanging around her head. But what's happening? She's surviving this recall. Now you can blame it on a lot of things, but there's a couple of things we should know. Here's here's what my analysis tells me. The first thing, and it's going to hurt Anchorage, I'm just letting you know. This is going to hurt. But I'm going to tell you because I think you need to be aware. Either because conservatives are not going out there and voting, or what I think is happening is that Anchorage is no longer red, rose, or purple. It is light blue to blue. Anchorage is a blue municipality now. Bottom line. Anchorage is a blue municipality. That's what I want you to take away. If you don't hear me, hear this. Anchorage, by voting counts, and by what we've seen in both of these recall efforts, particularly in Midtown, Anchorage is a blue municipality. Like it or not, that is my analysis. And if you go back and look at the presidential election, you'll see that. Trump lost Anchorage. He lost Anchorage. Biden got more votes than, than Trump did in 2020. The trends are there. Sure, you have pockets here and there. You have, you have communities, small neighborhoods that are voting conservative. Yeah, absolutely. But overall, it is looking like Anchorage is not a red or a purple, but a light to dark, a light to medium blue. Now, conservatives, you don't like that? Get out and vote. Registered voters have shown to be more sort of libertarian Republican. But those turning out and voting, oh no, that, that is most assuredly Democratic and left-leaning. So Anchorage is trending blue. 
Here's the other analysis. Without Eagle River, Bronson wouldn't have won. Donald Trump wouldn't have won. At least the municipality as a whole. Chugiak and Eagle River are keeping what slim margin of conservatism out there as a, as a majority. They are keeping it a majority. And that's a, that's a sobering thought. That is a sobering thought, considering that Eagle River wants to actually exonerate itself from Anchorage. Listen, it's the bottom line. I know we don't like it. I know that conservatives are really frustrated. But the bottom line is this. Anchorage is trending blue. And so what is the final analysis? Here's the final analysis. You may have a conservative mayor. You may have two conservative representatives from Eagle River. But unfortunately, you're going to have a left-leaning majority for a long time. You are. I'd like to think that Stephanie Taylor has a shot at beating Forrest Dunbar to start evening out, at least balancing the assembly. I just don't think it's going to happen. I don't. I don't think it's going to happen. For whatever the reason, whether it's conservatives or not getting out to to mail their ballots because they just don't like the system, so they're not partaking in it, which is wild. Or, what's even scarier, is the fact that this city is turning into a left-leaning city. It is turning into a San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, L.A. nightmare. And thus, we will reap the benefits of that type of policy and mentality. Don't get it wrong. Don't get it twisted. If this is what Anchorage wants, there's going to be a mass exodus because I feel like this is where we're trending. So guess what? Those of you who wanted these left-leaning policies, this overspending, these, these social justice movements that supersede what should be regular business, if you want the assembly to take control of your life, which they have, to dictate what you can and can't do, if this is what you want, it's coming. It's coming. And you will reap the benefits of that. And when people start to leave the city or leave the state because they don't want to be a part of something like that. And we've already seen mass exodus from Washington, Oregon, California. They're moving to Montana. They're moving. You know what's interesting? Again, it's like a virus sometimes. They're moving to red states because red states are not dealing with the same fiscal issues that these um, the examples I'm using in the PAC Northwest in California are dealing with. I mean, the amount of people that have left California to move to Texas, Florida, Tennessee is astounding, which also creates the problem is you're going to bring those same policies that screwed up the state you came from to the state you're currently in. And this is what we have here in Anchorage right now. Don't get it wrong. This is what we have. Places like Fairbanks and the Kenai Peninsula, uh, the Valley, Eagle River, Chugiak are still strongholds for conservatism. But Anchorage itself, nope, not happening. It's not happening. And it's really too bad. I moved from New England back to Alaska because I wanted my kid to grow up in what I wanted conservative values. Not just in the home, but in my schools and in my community. And it's disappointing. I'm sorry, it is disappointing. I did not move from Boston, Massachusetts to move back here to be dealing with the same sort of policies and, and games that were played there. This is highly disappointing and frustrating. And I don't know long term what that means for me or my family, but I can tell you this. If you're a conservative and you do not vote, shame on you. I don't want to hear your complaining because I did vote and I wanted conservatism running this place or at least a balance in the assembly. And now I got to figure out what to do because I'm, I'm in the same position I was in in Massachusetts and it's frustrating. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels this way. But alas, here we are. So what does that mean? I don't really know. But I do know this. My time is running out. Listen, it's not all doom and gloom. Part of today was me venting because I'm frustrated. 
But I'm sure you're frustrated too. I'm sure there's a lots of Alaskans that are frustrated. And you know what? They're probably frustrated on both sides of the aisle too. So with my frustration, what do I want to do? I want to have conversations. I want to have conversations with people who don't agree with me so that I can explain my worldview. So they can understand why I'm frustrated. And I'm willing to listen to why they're frustrated. And at the end of the day, that's the only way this is going to get better. Guys, we are facing a major chasm between groups of people in the United States right now. It's no doubt. There are two groups of people that seem to be at odds with one another. And it's got nothing to do with race right now. It's got to do with political ideology. And we're allowing people to continue and policy to continue to further that schism. And I don't want that anymore. I do want to have the conversations. Listen, I asked Forrest Dunbar to come on the podcast because I wanted to hear. And I wanted you to hear what he wanted to do as mayor. But he denied that. Because you know what? I don't think everybody's interested in actually mending and fixing. I think there is not just money, but there's political points to be gained by keeping this chasm going wide. I just don't think it's going to end well. I don't want that to happen. And I think we as a country have always been able to heal. Unfortunately, it seems like at some level, it's a point of no return. And I hope that's not the case. Well, guys, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, Probably not the best, fun, exciting podcast. But you know what? The news is the news. And we've got to report and, and speak on it and give some commentary on it. So there you go. But if you haven't had a chance right now, if you love what we do, if you want to help us continue to provide this content, go to mustreadalaska.com. And at the top right, you'll see the donate uh, portion of the website. Any donation helps. And really what we want to do is continue to provide the content to you on a daily basis. Suzanne does a phenomenal job. John Quick does a phenomenal job. And I'm just here riding their coattails. So I appreciate you all. And again, any little bit of support helps. And if you haven't had a chance, find us on Facebook, YouTube, WeMe, Parlor, Twitter, the, the works, Rumble. You can find it all under the same handle, which is Must Read Alaska, one word. Guys, we just appreciate you. I want to let you know that everything we do is to make sure that you get a fair, full perspective view of the news, not just a narrative, but a full perspective view of the news. And you get a little bit of my commentary, which I don't know if you like or not, but I certainly don't mind giving it to you. All right, guys, until next time, take care.